So our next talk goes in a little bit different direction. It's about causal inference. Hi, Eyal. How are you? Hi, Martin. Hi, everyone. From where are you streaming from? Uh, from London. London. OK, great. Yeah. So and you are talking about causal inference now. Yep. OK. Um, great. great. Thanks a lot. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, as I said, my name is Ayal. I'm speaking from London. I am a senior data scientist in a health tech company named Babylon. And I'm really excited to talk about causal inference. And for um, most of you uh, who this is an introductory to, I'm very glad to talk about this. Uh, just before I start, um, I want to just emphasize that these are my opinions, not those of my employer. And uh, Martin, can I just ask how many people are attending the talk? Do you happen to know that? Uh, in any case, um, if unfortunately, anybody... I can't. Uh, I can't tell you because I can't see the number at the moment. But um, I can't. I can't tell you after the talk. Okay, great. So, in any case, I recommend whoever likes taking notes. Um, that's great. But I also uh, put up all the slides on Google um, on Google Slides. So feel free to use that. If there happen to be more than a hundred people on the talk, then um, it would be a good courtesy to make a copy of your own because they do have that limit. Uh, okay, great. So I'm ready to start. Um, we put a lot of trust in data, so much so that we value the opinion of experts, for example, researchers, to tell us what is healthy and not healthy to put in our bodies. We have so much trust in data that we're willing to provide it to non-sentient beings, like machines, to analyze it, learn from it, and make suggestions for us for what actions to take a procedure that's commonly known as machine learning. We're all beneficiary for, beneficiaries of this. For example, we live healthier lives than previous generations. And we're also walking around with smartphones with really powerful apps that make great suggestions. My personal favorite is Google Maps. I love the fact that I have access to so much data so I can better navigate the city. So one way to put it is that we have a lot of confidence in data and uh, decisions that we can make based on it. But we all know that sometimes researchers might misinterpret the data. That will be a big part of this talk of how data might be misinterpreted and how we overcome that. We also know that the algorithms that machine learning um, use, sometimes they result in ridiculous conclusions. For example, um, this image recognition uh, result totally failed to recognize a stop sign it has a lot of confidence in calling it uh, a, uh, a speed limit sign. And so this raises the questions, um, how much trust can we put in the data? The reason being is that the researcher or the machine learning developer, they're kind of, sometimes they're apologetic in which they say, well, we don't really truly understand the causation because correlation, correlation does not imply causation. And so then we really have to ask the question, how much trust are we gonna put the data on data on its own. As a researcher, my experience tells me that data is a great first step, but what we really want is an understanding of the data in order to trust it. What I've been following recently is um, Judah Perel, who's considered the godfather of causal inference. Him and his researchers for the past 30 years have really been um, propagating what they call the causal revolution. And so we can truly get beyond correlations and really make decisions based on causality, meaning understanding the impact of one parameter on another. So just um, one way of paraphrasing a lot of his research is within this sentence, is, um, which is the main takeaway from this talk, is that the story behind the data is as important as the data itself. So throughout this talk, I'll emphasize this point time and time again, where what we'll start with is misinterpretation of data. How, by understanding the, the story behind the data, we can avoid misinterpretations. I will also introduce an awesome tool called graphic models, which help us visualize the story behind the data. And this is a very useful addition for any analyst toolbox. Those are the main two points I'm imagining for most of the audience. Um, Another takeaway for those who are really keen and want to take things further is I will suggest first steps to learn the topic that I felt were useful for me. 
There's no expected background in terms of statistics. It's very minimal. The target audience that is in mind is anybody who makes data-driven decisions. So analysts, of course, will benefit from this, but not limited to developers or managers also. They all make data-driven decisions. And what you'll get out of this talk is going beyond the common usage of correlations and better to understand what is required to make those better decisions using causality. I have over 15 years of experience of data analysis. I started my career as an academic. Throughout my career, I used uh, different data sets. For example, I started off analyzing astronomical data to learn about things like the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, then in 2014, I transitioned to the private sector. I worked in consulting for a while. So there I worked, for example, with restaurant chains or bus operator data. Uh, then I went back into the sciences in which I worked in a um, in a biotech uh, lab in which I worked with protein engineers, um, so in DNA data, and now I work with health data. For me, causal interference is a real emotional roller coaster, as I describe over here. If I'm, if I'm successful today, you will learn a few things. If I'm really successful, you'll have a better appreciation for us as, as, as homo sapiens and how we manage to really critically think and manage to quantify impacts of intervention. But I do have to give you a heads up that there will be stages today of complete confusion. And if I'm good at what I'm doing, hopefully you'll be able to overcome that. In order to um, overcome confusion, what I found useful is normally I prototype within Jupyter Notebooks, but in order to really understand statistics, I like to visualize um, and play around, use toggles. And for that, I'm really, um, uh, really very appreciative for, um, for people that work uh, in Streamlit, in which they really enable me to go from prototype to a nice UI uh, web app that I can host both locally and they're hosting for me. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you access to apps that help me understand this topic of causal inference better. So what we're going to do, you can imagine that we're going to, we have this, um, what Judah Pearl calls this causal ladder. And what we're going to do is I'm going to describe climbing of these rungs, where right now, most of us are right over here and we're dealing with statistics and machine learning. They give us really amazing results, but at the end of the day, it's dealing with correlations and it's, you know, where robots and maybe um, more primitive sentience are. And as we, and today I'll kind of bring you towards the second rung called doing in which we're able to do causal inference for subpopulations. Uh, and then I'll just mention for those who are keen to learn more about how to get to the third rung in which you'll be able to do causal inference, not for a group at large, but rather for each individual, each individual, which is a really powerful thing. And that will be in the summary. So this will be our, um, our uh, trajectory for today. I'll start talking about the limitations of correlations. I'll give a lot of examples. And then I'll talk about Simpson's paradox. What it is, it's a situation uh, in which data might be misinterpreted. So I'll describe what it is. You learn how to identify it, how to resolve for it. And this is where um, that said app will come into play and you'll be able to play around with that for yourself. Uh, then I'll introduce uh, something that's missing in the um, in, in common vocabulary in mainstream statistics, which is graph models, which enables us to visualize the story behind the data so we can have true trust in understanding what we're doing with the data. And we'll use it also to do a um, um, very important step in causality, which is controlling for what's called confounders. It's okay if you don't know what that is, I'll describe it later. I love the way that um, Randall from XKCD uh, describes various um, uh, various things in math and in computer science. For example, here very nicely um, articulates like correlation versus causation, in which you see at the end of this conversation that she basically asks, was this intervention successful? And he is inconclusive. And that's what happens a lot of times with correlation. Uh, right at the end of the day, no matter how much effort we put into it, we just don't know. We're inconclusive about the result, and the reason for that can be seen as like this example over here, in which if we might have two data sets that are totally, they might appear to be totally unrelated, and they happen to correlate. 
right? If you just do linear regression or you give it to a machine learning model, right? It's just two columns of data and it might find something potentially interesting, but you really need somebody who actually understands what this data means in order to see this is something that we can actually take action on. Is the marriage rate in Kentucky anywhere related to the amount of people who drowned after um, falling from a fishing boat? So what's the story behind the data? We'll continue with the, um, with the theme of drowning, uh, but from a different aspect. Let's imagine, for example, that you're working in a city council that has a beach and you wanna figure out when you should put lifeguards um, in order to uh, reduce the amount of drownings in the city. So what time of year would you put it or what time of day? In order to answer that question, well, what sort of data do you need to answer that challenging question? Well, if you, if, if you take this sort of data and you compare it to a lot of other and you just look for correlations, then your linear regressor will just suggest, hey, you can compare this to ice cream sales. Obviously, if, uh, if a company um, that produces a lot of ice cream suddenly sells more because of a promotion, well, you know that's not going to cause many drownings. So most of you in the back of your mind, you already know the solution to this, and I'll get to this in the next slide. Um, but first, let's look at two more useful examples. So one has to do with fire alarms. Right? So let's say that you're working in a company that's engineering for uh, home safety devices, and you want to improve the fire alarm. So what sort of data would you collect in order to test to see if you're really doing any improvement? Should you test for like fire data, like changing the distance or the heat of it, for example? Or is there something else, some other data that might be useful to better learn about this device that you're developing? Nowadays, we know that smoking causes lung cancer. But back in the 1960s, that was still controversial. Like we had data on smoking, we had data on lung cancer. There was a correlation, but was there causation? For example, the tobacco industry made the argument that, well, maybe there's a causal, uh, uh, a common uh, a component called um, uh, DNA that might be, uh, our genes might be impacting both, which is not present in the data, and that's very hard to analyze. So what we see here is a problem, right? We have a lot of problems that we want to solve, and we have one we have one data set like drowning. What other data would be useful in order to answer for this question? Um, and so in order to resolve this, we need to know the story behind the data. How were the drownings generated? How Where the ice cream cells come from? So most of you probably guessed that it has to do with weather. Right? The hotter it is, the more drownings and the more ice cream you're going to sell. Okay, so this is a, a, a common factor between them, okay, or a common cause. When I said fire, fire alarm, actually what I was referring to is more properly is called a smoke detector because what it's detecting is not the fire, it's detecting its mediator, which is called smoke, which is the smoke. Right? You can imagine, for example, a room full of fire, but there's like a, lot, a huge breeze towards the window and no smoke gets to the alarm, and so the alarm won't detect the fire. So this mediator, smoke in this case, is what you really want to test in order to uh, figure out how the quality of your uh, smoke alarm. And the conclusion of the um, of smoking causing lung cancer, well, that was resolved due to the fact that uh, researchers realized that the cigarette itself is not causing pure, poor health. It's actually the tar that's being uh, de uh, deposited within the lungs. And that does not depend on the DNA. And so this uh, is another mediator in which that resolved the question of causality. And so that means that they understood the story behind the data and they realized, oh, we should be collecting data on this tar in order to prove causality. So that summarizes the first step in which we appreciate now the limitation of just correlation and why we need the story behind the data. Now we'll talk about an interesting artifact called Simpson's Paradox, which is a situation in which data might be misinterpreted. Just before I start, I wanna emphasize that all the data here is made up, but it is plausible. You might have situations in your own data sets that you're currently analyzing or making decisions on. And for simplicity, you might see small numbers, but we're not concerned with statistical significance. Just if you are concerned with the small number, just multiply times a thousand or a million, but it's the same conclusions. So we're gonna go through this imaginary study and I'm gonna present, um, so, 
Imagine that you are in a board meeting in a pharmaceutical company. You've been waiting for months for results of a study and you have to make a very expensive decision if to continue to develop a drug for market or should you actually stop it and go with another drug. So the study contains 2006 patients where it's equally distributed to control group, which means they have a placebo versus treatment where they actually get the drug. And so you're listening to the analyst and they say, well, the result from the treatment group is that 58% recovered and the result from the control group, actually 72% recovered. So the immediate conclusion from that is 58 is smaller than 72 and by 14%. And so that means the drug is deleterious. It has a harmful effect and that suggests that we should stop this very, exp very uh, expensive uh, uh, project. But of course, you know, you don't want to make those decisions hastily. You want to really understand the data. And so the main stakeholder asked the analyst, well, let's look a little bit deeper. Maybe it's beneficial for males and not females. And so they, they go into, um, oh, just beforehand, um, it's very useful to look at visuals of distribution. So um, before males and females, here you can see the control. Uh, the difference between control and treatment is 14%. Okay, so now the analyst looks and they say, well, I see actually two interesting things. First of all, the females, they recover much more frequently than the males. It's 90% versus 50% uh, in, in treatment and 80% versus 40% in the control. But also when we compare treatment versus control, we see that the treatment for both males and females recover 10% more than the, um, uh, than, than the control. And that suggests the, an alternative solution that um, or result that the drug is actually beneficial by an absolute 10, 10%. So it's the same data and we have two alternative conclusions. So this might appear to be some sort of analytical illusion. It actually has, it has a name, it's called Simpson's Paradox. And what we'll see in the next few slides, what it is at the end of the day, it's a misinterpretation of the data. It's named after Edward Simpson, who developed it in the 1950s. It was actually mentioned in the early 20th century by you. And one interesting aspect of him is that um, before that, in, during World War II, he actually worked about one hour train ride from where I'm sitting at um, what's called Bletchley Park, in which him and the father of computer science, Alan Turing, and other statisticians, they managed to break the German uh, Enigma encoder in order to help the Allies win World War um, too. And uh, so if you're looking for something off of the beaten track here in London, I highly recommend visiting that. Currently, it's a museum. All right, back to our case study. So all above is the same thing. We have the two separate conclusions. What I'm adding here is the uh, full data of the cohorts. Um, like I said, you have these slides. You can sit on these later if, if you're not seeing it right now. But basically, all the numbers add up where the End result, the treatment minus the control calculation for the total population is minus 14. For the males, it's 10%, uh, a positive 10%. For females, it's also a positive 10%. So this is the confusion that arises. This is the Simpsons paradox. And here I'm just visualizing it. Here we're doing treatment minus control, population minus 14, and then each cohort has 10%. So how do we resolve this? It's very useful, as you can see by now, that visuals uh, are, are key in order to resolve, to understand these problems and to solve for them. So what I'm highlighting here in, in red is the actual population result. So here you have uh, control and here you have treatment um, in which uh, you can see this difference that I mentioned, minus 14%, which is here on the horizontal axis. I should also emphasize the uh, vertical axis. This is the number of participants. So you see 1,000 participants in each. Um, and which uh, these red lines are actually factors of these gray ones. It's a weighting on them, in which you can see that here we have a group with a uh, with, with a recovery rate of 80% versus, and that's 800 a number, and this is 40% at 200. And so this is the average of them, and we have the same thing but the opposite over here. So how do we resolve this? Well, um, what we can do is actually we can look at the cohorts themselves. So here you can see here are the females and here are the males. And the 10% is what I'm displaying over here. Here you can see both males and females have uh, a beneficial effect. By the way, I want to give credit to Mark Platz who came up with this design uh, presentation. And uh, in the comments, I have a link to his blog post in which he first showed this. So 
what is the mis what, what's the source of the misinterpretation? Well, probably a lot of you have figured out by now that what's happening is that we have an uneven distribution of the um, of the cohorts. So even though we have a thousand males and a thousand females, actually you can see the males are only 200 of the control, 800 of the treatment, and vice versa for the females. And so what that means is that both the recovery and the group variables, they both depend on gender. And that's what we call a confounder. And the problem, the, the fact that we have minus 14 here and 10 here and 10 here is because this metric that I called uh, treatment minus control does not account for this confounder. And so it's, it gives it this, this weird biased result. What should we trust? Well, we know if something's beneficial both for males and for females, well, it's going to be beneficial for the population. That, that's just common sense. And so how do we result, how can we create a metric that's actually more meaningful for the population? Well, before we get to that, let's formally define. Um, so instead of calling just treatment minus control, what it is, it's called a risk difference. And here I'll kind of formalize it a bit more. So the risk difference is the difference in the recovery rate between the uh, control group, sorry, the treatment group to the control group. If you're wondering with this pipe here, that means just conditioned on. That means here we're focusing just on the treatment group and here we're focusing just on the control group and we're uh, subtracting. So it's basically this 58% um, this minus 72 or 50 minus 40. That's all we're doing over here. And here I'm just quoting the results. So um, this is a, a, a good step, except for the population. We should not, it's fine to do it for the males and females, but not for the population. For the population, what we want to do is you want to take the same risk difference, but we want to weight it by the population itself. And that's a way for us to control for that confound. What we're doing is we're doing a weight adjustment. Uh, and so here I'm just... Um, here I'm just rolling it out. Here you can see the risk difference of the males, 10% times the 50% of, of the female uh, of the males in the population at large. That's, so that's the weight, plus the same for the females. And that gives me this average causal effect, or ACE for short, of 10%. Uh, so that's the solution to this. And here's just uh, a, a visual where I showed the problem before. And here's the solution. We see it at 10%. Now I'll be the first to admit that this is still confusing. This took me a few good weekends in which I had to sit down, I had to visualize and try to make sense of this. And what I found very useful for me is to just create an app. And that's what I'll show you over here. Um, you actually have access to it, so you can go online and play around with it. Um, and a lot of thanks to Streamlit again for, for their API and for hosting. Uh, so here I'll just show you, give you a quick run of, 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 that, of the demo. In, 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 which is interactive. Um, so here, I'm just showing the data frame of this uh, uh, of, of this uh, made up data. And so here's the problem with this visual. Uh, here's the Mark Platz visual um, showing the same minus 14%. Um, and here I'm showing the solution in which what we want actually, instead of this um, risk difference of the population, we want to use the ACE. And here is this visual in which you can see that this plays well with uh, both the males and females. You can see the treatment is better than group. But let's take it, let's look at the interactive stage of it. So there are a few parameters that go into this. And the one of, uh, of interest to resolve um, that causes Simpson's paradox is the fact that the males and females didn't have the same distribution within the treatment. So here it was at 20%. If I bring it higher to like 35%, you can see that these are not impacted, but this one, which doesn't, take into account this confounding factor, it's actually, you know, gives us another like meaningless result. Okay. Um, and here you can see the heights are nearly equal. Um, to really bring it home, what we'll do is we'll bring this to 50%. And this is mean that we have even males and even females. And so what that shows over here is that the risk difference of the population is as you'd expect from, um, from, from, um, <clears throat> And this is the and this is the case of the uh, uh, of what we'll get to later as random control trial. Um, I think there are quite a few people on the app, so I did prepare another app. I'll just hold, host it locally because I do want to show one more thing. But feel free to play around with it. Um, yeah. So another example I want to run is um, here. I'll just put this. Uh, and here, um, so let's say that, yes, so you notice here how 
um, I'll just show this. I'll be in solution mode. You can see how here the males are 80% here and 70% here. This is another parameter I can play around with. And so here's the 80% and 70%. And now let's make these even. Let's see what happens. So here I bring it down to 70%. And here you can see now this and this are even. And what do we see here? Well, here we see that the males, there's no difference, right? That's this fact that these are aligned. And the females are the same, it's the same 10%. It's the difference between this and this. Okay, and what um, here it shows us something nonsensical. It doesn't take into account the confounding factor. What does the ACE do? Well, the ACE does exactly what we expect. The average between zero to 10%, we get this 5%. There's a lot of other examples that I found useful playing around with this app. So feel free to, um, to use it in order to understand this complicated topic of Simpsons Paradox. Again, it's really not intuitive and take it from Homer. Um, what I suggest is that, you know, take your time, sit on the numbers, play around the app. At the end of the day, you'll figure it out. Visuals are very useful. And I love this visual that I pulled from Info We Trust, in which it introduces the continuous version of Simpsons Paradox. Simpsons Paradox, as I described it, is uh, with discrete data, um, right? It was categorical recovery, no recovery, genders, um, treatment control, but Lloyd's Paradox, deals with situations which you have continuous data, for example, medicine in milligrams, or uh, for example, health score. And what you see beautifully here illustrated is the Simpsons paradox or Lord's paradox. Here, imagine that you didn't know um, the cohort of each, right? Each Simpson here is a cohort. So if this was all like gray dots, then basically what you have here is um, you, you have an apparent uh, correlation. But once you get, it, get the information on the cohorts, men, boys, girls, and, female, and, and, and women, you actually see that there's a deleterious effect, right? It's going in the opposite direction. So this is a very good, uh, useful visual to uh, understand Simpson's and Lord's paradox. So that concludes the first part of this talk. We talked about the limitations of correlations, and then we introduced Simpson's paradox as a situation in which the result of a population might be in total conflict of that of its cohorts. And so that's a concern because you might misinterpret your data and get to wrong conclusions and make wrong decisions. How do we resolve for this? Well, we appreciate the fact that we have a confounding factor that we have to control for. Those who are really interested in understanding causal inference, I suggest mastering this topic of the Simpsons paradox so then you can really get into uh, deeper uh, levels of understanding of causal inference. For most of the Next part, next part of, of, of this talk, I will focus on this issue of confounding factors and how we control for them, when we should, when we shouldn't, and what tools we have in order to do so. But beforehand, I have to address random control trials, right? That is what most people understand as to be the golden standard of causal inference in the sense that we use, um, we do the scientific trials in which we, um, we, we, we try our best to control for as many parameters as possible, except for the treatment and the output parameters. We hold everything fixed, we hope for the best, and then we can say, ah, we have causality. Uh, but there are a lot of limitations to this. First of all, later on, I'll talk about the fact that we shouldn't confound for everything. It should be actually justified beforehand. Uh, but even regardless to that, there are many practical issues. For example, random control trials are very, can be very expensive and the logistics, logistics behind them, right? Equalizing between the genders or you can do age demographics, et cetera. Um, so that's like, um, can be a logistical nightmare. Uh, second, things might not be physical or ethical. For example, if you want to test for smoking habits, well, you can't force people to smoke for 10 years, right? And also a lot of times you want to investigate populations in their natural habitat, not in something artificial. And so all these are arguments for um, what can come in place of random control trials, which is much more accessible. That's what's called observational data. Basically, that's the data that we have with our own work environments or just free online that we can use. And so um, this causal revolution is helping, is building, has been building tools for the past 30 years in order to do causality on these much more accessible data where the main idea is understanding the story behind the data and um, because that's important as the data itself. So I talked about the topic of controlling for parameters. 
I love that to listen to podcasts like Freakonomics, in which you have talk experts and researcher talking about their um, about their topics of research. And a lot of times you might hear them talking about controlling for many factors like um, age, gender, uh, income, uh, social so social status, etc., and just like a shopping list of, of, of parameters. And the question is: Is that true? Should we should we uh, control for everything? And the answer to that is we should not do this blindly, but rather every time we control for a factor, it should be justified. Well, how do we justify this? Well, we have to use some sort of common sense. And this is where graph models, um, introducing it to our vocabulary and adding it to our um, tool case of analysis, it's a really powerful way for us to tell the story behind the data in order to make better educated judgments on what we should control for and what we shouldn't. And that will be the focus of the next uh, uh, of the last part of the talk, in which I'll introduce graph models, why it helps us visualize the story behind the data, and how we use it to justify controlling for confounders. So first, let's start with the definition of a graphical model. So just imagine that you have variables, and you just graphically you put them into nodes or ver vertices. That's what these are, and if I want to relate between two parameters, then I just draw an edge between them. So for example, C and A have some sort of correlation between them, uh, where C and B are independent from each other. Um, changing one does not impact the other. That's a graphical model. Uh, then we have something called a directed graph, which is taking the next step, right? We want to go beyond correlations. We want to go to causation. And so by instead of replacing, adding to the edges an arrow, so that says, which parameter is listening to who? And what I mean by that, for example, is changing A will change, cause some sort of change in D, but not vice versa. Here we happen to have a cyclical relationship between D and C. Changing D will change C, and changing C will change D. In, ca in causal inference, most of the time what we deal with is actually something even simpler than that. It's called a direct acyclic graph, or DAG, in which we make sure that we don't have that sort of feedback. So what that means in practice is starting from any parameter, for example, A, following the arrows, you'll never get back to A. That's what a DAG is, essentially. So why are graphical models useful? Well, they tell the story behind the data. For example, they enable us to tell how the data was collected. We can put that information in the graph. And like I said before, we can say which parameter is listening to which. So what can we actually do with that sort of information? Well, first, we can um, design better experiments. We can be more cost efficient. It's beyond the topic of this talk, but for example, you can figure out which um, parameters are worthwhile collecting information from and which you actually don't need to, um, to tell the story. And of course, the most important thing is with these graphs, we can draw causal conclusions and not um, be stuck just with correlations. So let's actually look at a graph model that will simplify our understanding of Simpson's paradox. So I know it was kind of a burden trying to understand it, and it's still confusing, but that's where graphs are, are great. They help us understand what's actually going on. And here's the story that, here's exactly the story that we were telling before, if you remember. So gender is independent, nothing's impacting it, but the group um, was a function, it wasn't independent, it depended on the gender, right? We had that uneven split, and that's what we're learning from this arrow. And recovery rates depended on both. So this is presenting the Simpson's paradox problem. In order to solve for it, what do we do? Well, we controlled for the confounding factor, the gender. And so effectively what we did is we did what's called graphical surgery and we took off this arrow. So now both group and gender are independent, where recovery rate still depends on both. So what does this graph represent? Well, it either represents what we're actually doing in a random control trial where we um, control for the gender distribution, but even with observational data, right, um, without uh, without controlling beforehand, we can still do the um, weighting adjustment that I mentioned before, what we call the ACE metric. So it represents both, basically. So I have to address the topic of subjectivity, um, because it's probably in the mind of, of many people listening, the fact that I'm applying my opinion on the relationships uh, uh, between the parameters. A lot, a lot of people think that researchers, statisticians, uh, and anything that has to do with science um, are, are really objective, and because that's what we see read in test textbooks. But in everyday research, what we, really, what we really know is that there have to be subjective decisions made along the way, and the challenge is really to make sound judgments that reflect reality. I'll just give you a few examples. 
um, any developer knows that if you have this distribution um, and you want to quantify that somehow, well, if it's an if it's a nice belt curve shape, then it's pretty simple. You have the mean and you have the variance. But if it's kind of skewed, well, what's more meaningful? Is it maybe the median? Or if there's like a few modes to it, do I choose the highest mode? So that's a decision. Another decision that a lot of times we make is binning of histograms or how we present numbers. It can be on a linear scale or if there's a few orders of magnitude, we might do a log scale. So all of these are subjective decisions that we do in our daily lives as analysts and decision makers. Um, but the, the challenge again is to make sound decisions. So yeah, so graphs um, are based on subjectivity, but beyond the scope of this talk is the fact that there is um, methods in which we can challenge our opinion, about, use the data to challenge our opinion about different regions within a graph. I'm just showing three nodes over here, but imagine a graph with many nodes and we can actually um, challenge our notions with the data. But again, that's a subject for who's ever really interested in taking their studies further. I should also mention that uh, causality isn't always possible. There's a, a, a list of uh, assumptions that are required to pass. For completeness, I'm showing them here. These are Each of these are taught within their own, but um, I'll actually the purpose of this section is talking about confounders. Um, this is what's called ignorability. It's the fact that all confounders have been treated. And so that's this last part over here. Let's see how we can um, good and bad practices of controlling for parameters and how we use graphs in order to justify this. So this slide is the same as before, but just to emphasize the fact that graph models are actually our vocabulary to indicate which parameters uh, we want to control for and which we shouldn't. And now I'll talk about this in practice when we should and when we shouldn't based on these types of graph flows over here. Uh, so here we have um, a, a, a relationship between X and Y in which it has this fork in which they have this common cause uh, variable called Z as opposed to this inverted fork in which there's this collider called C. So you can see the relationships are totally different uh, and what I'll show you the next few slides is that in, in the case of forks, we want to actually control for this uh, common factor in order to resolve for spurious correlations. But actually in inverted forks, we do not want to control for this collider because it will generate spurious correlations. All right, so let's go back to this example of drowning in ice cream. Well, we know that there's this common cause of the um, weather right, if the sun is out or not. So what happens if we don't um, control for the common cause? So we get something like this. We have this spurious correlation, right, in which um, we, let's say we know nothing about the weather in these data points. And so our I and our re regression, uh, um, in our regression algorithms will point out, hey, here's a um, correlation. And of course, this is spurious. Why? Because this, um, this common cause is a confounding factor and we should control for it. Um, just before we control for it, um, just to formalize this a bit, we say that X and Y are dependent when we do not condition on A. So even though we, these are not, um, that, that these uh, don't impact each other, the fact that we did not control for, for the weather means that um, they are mathematically, they are dependent when we didn't. On control for it. So how do we resolve for this? Well, of course, here this shaded color means that we control for it. And here we clearly can see if we analyze, for example, the sunny days, then there's no real correlation between the two and the same for the chilly days. Okay, so by um, controlling for the common cause, we resolve spurious correlations. So that's an argument, a justification for when we want to do that. And just to formalize this again, we say that x is independent from y, conditioned that we, uh, uh, when we condition on the common cause A. So that's quite intuitive. The graph makes a lot of sense. Um, now I'll show you something that's a bit more challenging. So this is an inverted fork, and I'm going to use switches on the wall in a light bulb as an example. So here you can see that the bulbs on the wall, um, they um, bulb on wall B, it depends both on switch one and, and switch two, and the switches them, and it's called a collider. The switches themselves, they are independent. And um, so here you can see, by that I mean that one's, one's up and the other's down. You, when one's up or down, and that's one, you don't know what S2 was happening with S2. 
I didn't talk about uh, the impact on bees, and it could be anything. It could be an or relationship. For example, it turns on as long as one of them is down, or an and relationship, where it takes both of them to be down in order to go on. Or I'll actually talk about this other, uh, another logic um, called XOR, in which it's on if they're actually in opposite situations. So let's look at this, and the conclusions are relevant for any resulting bulb. Uh, but it's useful to demonstrate on this. So when I'm not controlling for the uh, for the, for the bulb itself then these are independent as we saw as we started off but the interesting thing is that if we control for example for when the bulb is off you can see that by knowing s1 you know what s2 is they are correlated either up or down right and if we control for on they're actually anti-correlated when one's up the other's down and so you see by by controlling for this, uh, for, for, for this collider, we're actually introducing spurious correlations that weren't there before. This is a brief summary if you wanna go over the slides later in which I'm presenting all the cases, but I think that this example is enough to understand um, the situation. And so again, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because um, there's, I'm talking about the importance of spurious correlations. Um, Okay, thanks for that um, mention, Martin, I see it. Um, so I have until um, 10 minutes past two, I see, correct? Um, so yeah, so here I'm just summarizing the fact that we wanted to justify when we can, uh, uh, when we can control for parameters and when we can't. So here you can see, for example, in forks, we justified it, what we want to resolve these correlations, but when inverting forks, uh, we, we do not want to control these colliders most of the time, because we'll just be introducing these um, spurious correlations. Uh, and so um, that's the main takeaway for most of the audience. I'll just mention those who are really interested in, in, in causal inference and take it to the next step. This is a big part of causal inference, just identifying these colliders, these common causes, or if you remember earlier, I mentioned mediators, just um, when we should confound for them and which we, when we shouldn't, that is a big part in causal inference. Uh, just for completeness, I'm mentioning that I talked about two types of flows within DAGs. I talked about forks and inverted fo forks, and there's another one which is just called the chains. And here I'm just providing a cheat sheet in which you can learn about the independencies when you are um, uh, controlling for parameter A in each case. We're nearly at the end. Um, so here I just like to um, summarize. Um, what we've learned so far, and those who are interested, how we can how we can move forward uh, learning the topic. So I made the argument that at the beginning we're at this bottom rung in seeing, um, in which correlations is like seeing because um, because seeing may be deceiving, and I made the argument that just by using correlations we mis might misinterpret results. I demonstrated that both in Simpson's paradox, and I also talked about spurious correlations. With observational data, we can actually resolve this um, by doing an action called doing. As sentience, we actually learn, right, ever since we're babies, by actually doing things. And our mathematical equivalent of doing is controlling for the confounders, right? We can do random control trials, for example, right? Or we have this asymmetric. And with that, what we can do is we can learn causality on populations, right? We learned about, um, for example, uh, drug tests on genders, for example. Um, for those interested, there's this whole topic called do algebra, which actually gets into the fine details of, uh, of this. Uh, what's very much beyond this talk is this next one here, which is imagining. And so what imagining is, is we can do what's called what if conditional, uh, 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 hypothetical conditioning. And what the beautiful thing about this is that we'll be able to make um, understand the impact of interventions, not on a group, but rather on an individual. For example, you'll be able to answer questions like, how much would uh, one's salary increase uh, by another two years of college? Or will taking this medicine uh, cure my headache given past results? So you can really do it on an individual level, level as opposed to uh, large swaths of, 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 of populations. Um, and so the topic, uh, this is called counterfactuals. So here I'll be a bit cheeky and I'll take William Demings. He's a uh, statistician. I'm just gonna paraphrase his quote. And not only um, 
it's not enough to bring data, but you have to actually bring the story behind it. As, as a data scientist, I have many examples in which I got data and I didn't really trust it until I really understood the story behind how it was collected and then things actually made sense for me. Um, the mantra of this talk was that um, the story behind the data is as important as the data itself. And the reason for that is that it's crucial to understand how the data was collected and to understand the causal relationships between the parameters. And only in that way, we can actually make causal inference. So the way uh, I demonstrated the importance of the story behind the data is we talked about how data might be misinterpreted. If it's Simpson's paradox, if it's spurious correlations, I introduced an awesome tool to add to your toolbox called graph models in which you can visualize the story behind the data. And that enables us to see the causal relationships between the parameters. And we can justify actions like confounding for variables. For those interested um, in taking this further, I suggest mastering Simpson's paradox. And again, I, I recommend using this calculator. Any feedback you might have on it, that would be great. Um, also, there's this topic of dual algebra and counterfactuals in which you can really assess causal impact on cohorts or individuals. Uh, for those interested, uh, I, uh, I, I refer you to Alon Nier's talk. He's an excellent speaker. He'll give you a, a few different angles about uh, causal inference tomorrow and how to slide your way into that. I'll just end here with my resource pages, things that I found useful in my learning curve, in which I do highlight two books by Judah Perel. One is a popular science book, um, which really gives you a good intuition for the challenges and how to solve for them. Uh, and those more mathematically minded, I do suggest this textbook, um, which has only like four chapters in it and you can really learn a lot from it. Um, so with that, I think, yeah. Um, I'm glad to take questions at this stage. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. You got some comments like, this is a brilliant talk. Loving it, by the way. So that's always great. There are some questions, and we, we do have a little bit of time, maximum five minutes. We are already into the coffee break, but uh, I think that's fine. So, would you recommend repositories, catalogs of curated graph models? Repositories, catalogs of curated graph models. Mm, um, I'm not sure what that means, but I, I, I can um, I can give my opinion uh, about repositories. Uh, here, I suggested two repositories. Um, I'm not that familiar with them. I suggest anybody who uses it try to you know understand what happens behind them. Uh, I know the intuition of wanting to use a package as a black box. Uh, a lot of us um, kind of do it sometimes with uh, scikit-learn and things like that. But truly, you want to understand, for example, if you use a random forest, you want to understand the intuition, what the hyperparameters actually mean. Um, in order to build, um, in order to build uh, like uh, graphs, I highly suggest this. Uh, excuse me for the blasphemy, there's no solution for this in Python yet. So this is an R in which you can actually um, create your own graphs here. Um, you can change parameters. And really, uh, once you learn causal inference, you'll actually understand what all, this is what I was talking about, like um, independence between A and B. A and D are independent condition that we uh, control for E. That's what I was talking about. They have a whole lot of examples. For example, this is actual research. He's interested in the relationship between tooth loss and mortality, a lot of amazing things online. So um, I have a resource page here you'll have access to. I will add also a repository. Um, in the future, Alonir and I were building a repository um, to, um, in order to, uh, to provide these sort of tools and places that you can further learn the topic. Okay, next question. Beside medicine, can you cite examples of a causal interference Inference has allowed to establish causal relationships or interpret data correctly. The, the question continues. Are there such examples in economics, for example, proving that raising certain tax has a certain effect on unemployment? 
Sure, that, that's an excellent question. And of course, um, yeah, so I can tell you from my personal experience that um, that cause of appearance helped me structure my everyday work. Like my uh, current hobby is learning a system and quickly like creating one of these graph models like in the Stagity app and understanding the relationship between the parameters. And then I can first convince myself that um, what I'm seeing is actual um, causality or vice versa. At work, we have conversations that um, how to avoid Simpson's paradox and certain decisions that um, that our uh, stakeholders might be making. So, in, in, I can, on, on my own experience, I can say definitely when it comes to impact on, on the general public, um, I am not that 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 first. I, I do recommend. Um, there are a lot of, actually, there are a lot of examples within the book of why. So there you can really learn about example. He has a whole chapter dedicated to the resolution of the um, of the issue of the impact of smoking on um, uh, the impact of smoking on lung cancer. So that is a huge triumph. Um, oh, you said besides health and economics. Uh, I don't remember on the top of my head, but I, I would kindly refer you to the book of why that will explain that. That will, will give you like examples. So sorry about the dog. <laughs> and, so, no, no worries. And, and, I, and, and I also want to add the fact that, yeah, um, a lot of a lot of times Kazali is actually, it is hard. And you sometimes have limitations of parameters that you feel that you need, but it's just very hard to get, uh, to, to obtain. And of course, it's always a topic of subjectivity. So um, yeah, so put all that together. Hopefully within your work, you'll be able to implement cause of inference for what the immediate things that you're trying to uh, account for. I think we have time for one last question. It's about the common sense. Um, why ice cream sales can't cause drownings and sunshine because we use some kind of common sense to exclude that. And another question, real problems won't different people each have different common sense. Sure, but that, remember that that's what steers our lives, right? We make decisions based on our interpretation of the world. Um, that's me getting a bit philosophical. I can address like the ice cream sales, for example. Well, just do an exp like, well, I'll ask the question, how much money would you be willing to put in, um, you know, let, let's say that, that you're running an ice cream company and you want to really test, if I sell more ice cream, will I see more people drowning at the beach? I don't think any... Um, right-minded person will do that experiment. And I'm pretty sure that if they do, they'll fail because we know how, you know, you do want to consult with world experts and us as world experts of, you know, of weather, like the impact of weather, we know that more people go to the beach when it's sunny outside, right? We see that if we go to the beach, we see it ourselves, or if we read it in the newspapers. So that's why, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, any developer knows that you have to put your common intuition into things and you can't think, that, oh, everything's, we have to be uber objective. No, we do have to apply domain knowledge uh, into our mechanism. Those are familiar with, you know, Bayesian versus uh, frequentness inference, uh, you know that uh, Bayesian tends to give more uh, reasonable results when dealing with smaller sample sizes because you can introduce your belief where, of course, the disclaimer is you have to be still cautious about that. Yeah. So I think I kind of digressed here. Okay, thank you very much again. Wonderful talk. Great Q&A session. So we have five minutes time for a coffee break and the next will be the keynote.